Hi guys this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was in Avatar. The world could not maintain the peace that Naruto fought for in Jiraiya's memory. With a heavy heart, he forsakes his time and seals himself away in hopes of a peaceful future. What happens when a girl who wishes to express herself finds the sealed body of the hero of the flame, unleashes him, and learns from him? What will the future hold for the world? Before we start kindly like and subscribe to this channel, and look over the description box for the author of this amazing storyline. Welcome aboard. Chapter 5, Shinobi Way Year 3 About three months and two weeks after my showed her demonstration to the people of the capital, she and Naruto exited the ship that had taken them to one of the Fire Nation colonies of the Earth Kingdom. The reason they were there was because they had finally begun to do missions to increase Mai's experience as well as allow her to see the world outside of the Fire Nation. The mission was requested by an anonymous client who wished to speak to them in a small town called Hera that was near the colony they deported at. Along the way, Naruto warned Mai that missions with anonymous clientele should always be taken with suspicion and caution. If they did not know their client, then they could be walking into a potential trap. Mai took his words to heart and kept her eyes open for anything suspicious while he led her through the colony. Before, before they arrived, Naruto had spent three months with his student helping her find her elemental affinity. At first, she was confused and thought that it would be fire, considering where she was born. Naruto immediately shot down that assumption when he informed her that, even though he was born in Hai no Kuni, he had affinities for wind, the rarest of the country, and lightning, the second rarest. When she asked if that was all he could use, his answer surprised her. I may have affinities for those two, but that doesn't mean I can't use the other three. You should be able to do the same, but the element you are aligned with will be much easier to utilize. The immediate problem Naruto had with finding out Mai's affinity was that he had no chakra paper to see what it was. Thankfully, Kurama had a solution which was basically the same as when Naruto was helping Mai unlock her chakra. Naruto placed a thumb on her forehead and her navel, much to her embarrassment, and let Kurama take over his body to sense out the affinity. To Mai, she found herself back in her sensei's mindscape, and saw Naruto gazing at the happy people of Yuzu in sadness while Kurama had two tail tips where Naruto's thumbs once were. After what felt like ten minutes, Kurama finally spoke up. You have a single affinity for lightning. Lucky for you that Naruto has quite a bit of knowledge on that affinity, especially since he was nearly killed by one in his youth. That shocked the Nara descendant. How did he almost die? She asked hesitantly while watching her teacher as he continued gazing at his people. The fox turned its gaze to its host and sighed. It was by the one he once saw as a friend, a rival, and a brother in all but blood. Instead of me telling you, it then pointed a tail at one of the whirlpools and finished, look for yourself. Mai heeded the fox's words and gazed into the whirlpool, which showed her the, event the events of Naruto trying to stop Sasuke at the Valley of the End when the Uchiha was attempting to go to Orochimaru. She saw every detail of the fight from the words exchanged, to the blows dealt, and finally the finishing clash they had near the waterfall. Seeing Naruto change the trajectory of his attack from a killing blow to simply scratching the Uchiha's hiate made her respect for the blonde increase. Even when his friend expressed his desire to kill her sensei for power, Naruto still put their friendship above victory. Unknown to her, Naruto had walked up next to her and watched the final clash between himself and his old teammate. I should have stopped him that day, he said, making his presence known to her. I could have if I wasn't so naive and foolish. I once thought that everyone had the chance to change and better their lives, but I was wrong. It took me nearly my entire life before the end of the Fourth Great War to finally see that there are some people who cannot change because they are too far gone. Sasuke was one of them, along with Abito. My turn to her teacher sadly and asked, Is there any hope, sensei, for true peace? You fought for peace for a long time, but it never came. Do you deny its existence now? Naruto was silent at the question while Kurama mentally praised the girl for the depth of her question and how close to home it hit Naruto. There never really was much hope back then. 
Naruto answered truthfully before he gave a small smile. Just a fool's hope, and back then I was the fool the world needed. However, I'm not sure if this time needs, or even deserves, my help, especially when the Avatar is absent from their duties. At least the world made a replacement for me when I sealed myself away. How can it make a replacement for the initial replacement? Mai nodded at the answer before she and Naruto got to work training her in Raitun, Raitun Chakra. The first thing Naruto had her do was learn something he felt would be extremely beneficial to her training, learn the Kage Bunshin. Mai was surprised that he would teach her something as useful as that, but Naruto reminded the girl that as his apprentice, he planned to teach her as much as he could from his skills. It took half a month for Mai to successfully complete the jutsu, but she was only able to make two clones at the most before she felt incredibly drained. For the training, Naruto had her only use one clone to lessen the chakra and mental strain. Her first task was to use Raitun chakra to magnetize two small pieces of metal together. With the clone's help, she was able to get it down in a little more than a month, leaving her with about a month and a half to learn the next step. Said step of her training was creating a current of lightning from one hand to the other using pure Raitun chakra. She started from the tip of her middle finger, through her arm, down to her navel which was the main source of chakra, up to the next arm, and to the tip of her other middle finger, one. It was extremely difficult for her to do this step, and even at the end of the month and a half she wasn't quite there yet. Naruto had her practice it more during their two-week boat ride to the Fire Nation colony, and she progressed a little more, but not by much. She was able to send the current from her fingertip to her stomach, but bringing it back up the other arm was the challenging part for her. Unfortunately, she was unable to continue her training seeing as she and her teacher had arrived in the town where they would meet their client. They were to meet them in a small pub in the town for the details concerning their mission, much to Naruto's annoyance since pubs and bars were where the most deceptions happen on anonymous missions. As the duo stepped into the pub, they saw that it was mostly empty save for the bartender, a few patrons, and a cloaked individual sitting at, at a table in a darkened corner. The figure beckoned them over and master and apprentice sat across from them. I appreciate you accepting my request, Lord Uzumaki, said the figure in an older feminine voice. A job's a job, he replied simply, even if we are unaware of the identity of our client. Forgive me for the secrecy however, I cannot reveal myself to you just yet. All I can show you to prove that I am trustworthy is this, she replied, while showing Naruto a paisho tile in the design of a lotus flower. Naruto and Mai stared at the game piece before Naruto nodded to the woman, much to Mai's confusion. While this helps, I need more. So, answer me this, who knocks at the garden gate? The woman's reply was immediate, one who has eaten the fruit and tasted its mysteries. Once again, Mai was left confused while Naruto relaxed his guard slightly. All right, I'll hear you out. What is it you need done? A friend of mine is to be hung at dawn tomorrow in front of the people of Tarekia town about 20 miles from here. I have tried to appeal her case, but they refused to listen to me. What case and who is they? She was accused of murder and treason against the mayor of the town. But I know that she's innocent. She was on her way to Tarekia on the night of the murder, at least two miles away from the city. She couldn't have done it. But the people of the town are too caught up in finding an outlet for their anger at the death of their mayor that they're willing to hang her unjustly. I assume that you want us to not only stop her hanging, but find the real killer? If you do find the real killer, then that will be all the more helpful. However, my main request is saving her from death. Naruto nodded and turned to his apprentice. What are your thoughts on this? Mai took some time to quietly think it over while the cloaked woman smiled fondly beneath her cloak. She couldn't believe how beautiful Mai had become since seeing her so many years ago as a young girl. Thinking about that made the woman think back on how Tai Li, Azula, and Zuko were doing. She missed the children greatly and wondered if Zuko had finally gained the recognition he wanted from his father. She gave a quiet sigh at her musings before she shook herself out of her thoughts. 
Unknown to her, Naruto had sensed her emotions and was curious as to what exactly her connection was with his student and her friends. I think we should do it, Sensei. I can't just sit by knowing I could have done something for this woman, my answered after going over the mission details. Naruto nodded at his student before turning attention back to the cloaked woman. All right, we'll get your friend out of there. Thank you for this, Lord Uzumaki. I promise to pay you for your assistance as soon as you bring her back safely. Of course. By the way, we need the name of your friend so that we know who to look for. Yes, of course. Her name is Eva, a young nurse from the Earth Kingdom. Please bring her back safely. The two shinobi nodded before departing for Terekia Town. Near dawn the next day, Terekia Town Square. In the center of the town, a young woman with black hair and forest green eyes stood next to a rope noose with her wrists and, and ankles bound. Her face was covered in dirt and grime while her once decent clothes were reduced to rags. Her eyes were puffy from recent tears spilt and her aura read someone who had lost hope. The people yelling for her death did not care though. All they wanted was to see the murderer of their beloved mayor hung. Up in a tree near the edge of the town square, Naruto stood next to Mai who had an arrow readied in her bow. They watched on as the executioner put the loose rope around Eva's neck and readied to knock the stool out from under her feet. Naruto immediately saw where Mai should aim at, the knot in the rope that was about six inches above Eva's head. He gave a sideways glance to his student and saw her adjust her aim for the knot as well, making him mentally praise her. However, he saw her hesitate slightly with the arrow. Relax Mai, you can do this. It's a clean shot, he reassured her. He saw her struggle slightly with her aim before asking what the issue was. I'm worried, she answered nervously. I mean, what if I hit her? Naruto gave a small smile at her dilemma and placed a comforting hand on her back. You can do this Mai. I know you won't hit her because I have faith in you. Now, just relax. It's one clean motion, no hesitation. She nodded before readying her arrow again and releasing it. The projectile flew through the air before the tip sliced through the knot above Eva. Due to her surprise at this and her loss of balance, she began to fall backward off of the stool. Naruto took this chance to disappear, disappear from the tree and catch Eva in a burst of speed. Everyone in the square, besides Mai, looked on in shock at what had just happened while Eva had a blush on her face at the sight of her savior. The guards shook themselves out of their shock and readied their weapons around the spiky blonde. You there, release that woman so that she may pay for her crimes. Ordered one of them. Naruto gave them a bored look before a copy of him, and Eva appeared behind the guards and townsfolk. As the one surrounded by the guards faded into nothingness, the guards all flew back as if they were hit by invisible blows. Eva looked on in amazement at what her savior did before she began to feel dizzy and passed out from the mix of high speed and lack of food. The townsfolk foolishly decided to try and take the blonde down themselves after seeing the guards get knocked aside, but they were stopped when Mai appeared in front of Naruto with an arrow drawn and aimed at the people. Not another step closer, she ordered with her eyes narrowed. Naruto turned to the people and stated, you all truly are fools. To falsely accuse a woman who had no chance to kill you mayor just so that you could have a way to vent out your anger. Disgraceful. He then glared at them with a small burst of killing intent, making them all freeze in fear. Here's some advice, before you start accusing, look into all of the facts, so that innocent people like this woman in my arms don't get killed unjustly. With his final piece said, he told Mai to grab onto his arm before the three of them disappeared in a swirl of wind and static. When they reappeared near the outskirts of Hera, Naruto immediately began performing medical jutsu on Eva to fix any broken bones or injuries she had received during her confinement. He was relieved to see that the worst thing she had was slight malnourishment which could easily be remedied with some food. After healing her up, he began to carry her into town with Mai in tow. Once once they reached the center of town, the cloaked woman from before ran to them to check on her friend. When Naruto informed her of all that had happened, 
the woman led them to a small hotel where she was staying and had them lay Eva down on the bed in her room. Once she knew her friend was okay, she turned to Naruto and Mai and bowed to them. I can't thank you enough for your help. I hope this will be sufficient payment? She asked while handing them a small bag of coins. Naruto looked inside and counted about twenty silver pieces before nodding to the woman. Yes, this will do just fine. If that is all, then we need to be getting back, Naruto stated as he and Mai made their way out of the room. Wait please. Called out the woman before they reached the door. When they turned around, Mai gasped in shock at the revealed identity of the woman. El Lady Ursa. She whispered. Ursa appeared to be a healthy-looking woman with black hair tied in a single tail, amber eyes like many other citizens of the Fire Nation, and a caring aura. To Naruto and his empathic senses, the aura felt incredibly motherly and subconsciously reminded him of how it felt when he met his mother Kushina for the first time. He had also heard of the banished wife of Ozai through gossip around the town and from Mai herself when she told him about the current events of the world a couple years back. So. The lost mother of Zuko was our client. I have to say, I was not expecting this in the slightest, he commented. Ursa gave Mai a kind smile and commented, it's good to see you again after so long, Mai. And I'm impressed with your growth. Of course, that goes without saying since Lord Uzumaki here is your teacher. Please, Ursa-san, do not call me Lord. That title is reserved for the kami and the, spir the spirits themselves. No mortal should ever hold it. Is that why you don't refer to Ozai by that title? Asked Mai. No, the reason I don't refer to him as such is because Ozai is a manipulative bastard who would put honor and status above family. That man does not deserve his position or my respect, he answered before turning to Ursa. No offense to you, Ursa San. No offense taken, since I agree with you completely, she replied much to my surprise. I loved Ozai once, but after marrying him and seeing the future my children would live in, I couldn't believe who I had married. I hold no love for Ozai, but I do still care for my children. I'm pleased to see that you feel that way, Ursa San. Especially since your son has been banished for over a year due to dishonoring his father during a war meeting. Ursa gasped in shock at the news and asked worriedly, is he all right? Is he safe? I wouldn't know seeing as I've been focused on training my hair. However, you should know that Zuko was burned and scarred by Ozai during an Agni Kai in front of many people in the capital. Iroh has gone with him as he searches for the Avatar in hopes of regaining his lost honor. The banished mother lost strength in her legs and sat down in a chair in shock. My little Zuko. She whispered while a stray tear fell down her cheek. Mai's heart went out to her friend's mother and she consoled the woman with a comforting embrace. Ursa broke down in Mai's arms while Naruto quietly waited for the woman to calm herself. Due to his empathic ability, he felt waves of sadness and anguish roll off of the woman, and he silently wondered if his mother felt the same as she told him her final words before the QB was sealed into him. I guess I will never know. I can't return to the past and even if I was able to, I probably, I probably wouldn't since the man I am now would have never existed if I did so. If it makes you feel better, your parents showed nothing but love and regret before they died. Their love for you was unparalleled as was the regret of not being able to stay with you, commented the fox to its container. Naruto gave a soft smile at that and replied, yeah, it actually does make me feel better. After Ursa had calmed down, Naruto and Mai told her of what else had happened in the Fire Nation after Zuko's banishment. Much to the woman's surprise and slight amusement, when they told her of the banquet and how the two had danced under the moonlight, Ursa saw a faint coloring of Mai's cheeks as well as a slight aversion of eye contact with the woman. She smiled softly at how much Naruto had done for the girl, both as a teacher and as a friend. Well Ursa-san, we really should be getting back to the capital. While Ozai has no power over me, he could make things bad for Mai and her family if we don't return. The woman nodded before she remembered something important and handed the Uzumaki a scroll from her cloak. When he raised an eyebrow at the scroll, she elaborated, 
that is what I have been able to find out about the happenings of the Earth Kingdom from other members. I hope it's sufficient enough for you. He nodded in thanks before he and my bid the woman farewell and return to the ship. During one night on the return trip to the capital, Naruto approached Mai on the ship's deck to ask her something important. Important. Mai, I need to know something. Before I ask, I need to tell you that I want your completely honest opinion and answer. At her hesitant nod, he asked, if I were to leave the Fire Nation and go against Ozai, would you come with me? Would you be able to forsake your home and follow me? Mai was shocked at the question and her mind raced with possibilities as to why he would ask such a thing from her. Her mind kept pointing out that Naruto was against Ozai and the war he was making would cause far more harm than any other, except the Shinobi Wars. Her mind also told her that her loyalty should be to her home and her family there, however, her heart cried out to her just as loudly as her mind. Her heart told her to follow Naruto and to go against Ozai for the sake of the world, for a better future. And in the very depths of her heart, it also said to her to follow Naruto, because she had never connected with anyone so deeply before. He was her teacher, her friend, a person she could turn to, and the only person who truly understood her. I... I don't know. She whispered. I have no idea if I would follow you or not. Naruto sensed her emotions raging within her as she had thought of her answer, and when she had stated that she did not know, he was proud of her. She was fighting an internal battle of the mind and the heart and she was soon approaching a crossroad in life, duty to her nation or following a friend and mentor. If she had rushed into a decision, he had no doubt that she would regret it for the rest of her life. I didn't expect an answer from you now, Mai. Whatever you decide, I will respect your decision and support you. However, sooner or later you will come to a point in your life where you will have to choose. I hope you are content with the choice you make in the future. After he left her, her to her thoughts, she turned her gaze to the cloudy moonlit sky and wondered, what should I do? What would you do in my place, ancestors? One thing I knew for sure was that she had two weeks to think about her dilemma before her training resumed. Three months after return, five months left of the year. Naruto was currently watching my go at it with one of his Kage Bunshin, while focusing on using her Nara techniques and her newly learned Raiten technique. They had recently said their farewells to Tai Li who had chosen to join the circus in hopes of finally being able to become her own person and not part of a matched set with her five other sisters. Naruto and Mai had wished her all of the best. During the boat ride back home, Mai had practiced her right ton manipulation enough to finally complete the step she was on. She was able to successfully create an electrical current from one fingertip to the other one on her other hand. Naruto was pleased with her results and started her off on a jutsu of his own creation, a Sirank jutsu called Denatsumuchi Voltage Whip. The jutsu was just as the name implied, a whip made of pure right ton chakra formed from her pointer and middle fingers. The length of the whip, as well as the level of voltage, depended on the chakra output my released. I released. Right now, she was using the whip to try and strike the clone who avoided the strikes with ease. My, burst your chakra when the whip cracks for a higher release of electricity, Naruto advised. My nodded and swung the whip at the clone once more. As soon as the whip hit the ground where the clone dodged, my flared her chakra, and the whip cracked with a small discharge of electricity. A stray bolt hit the clone on the wrist, resulting in slight numbing of the area before it healed up. The original Naruto nodded and said, good work. Now, I want you to show me how far you've gotten with the Ryusei aim, Meteor Rain. Mai nodded once more and flew through hand seals before sending a bolt of lightning to the sky. The lightning stirred up some of the clouds and had them form overhead into storm clouds. Mai then held her hands in the dragon seal and yelled, Raitun, Ryusei aim no jutsu. The storm clouds began to fire small shots of lightning at the clone. The clone weaved around them easily, much to her annoyance, so she kept up the assault. However, she soon felt her reserves nearly depleted and she released the jutsu to rest. The original Naruto was proud of his student's progress. Over the months, she had brought her basic skills to an art form, 
her archery level was incredibly high, her skill with the Nara techniques was around high Chunin in level, and her Raiten skills were about high Jin into low Chunin. Not to mention that her Kage Bunshin limit had increased by one making it a total of three solid clones. The next thing he would have her do would be to sign the Gama contract and get her to summon at least up to a small battle toad before the end of the year. All right Mai, we'll resume training tomorrow. Go home and rest. Mai nodded and bid Naruto goodbye before she left for home. The blonde then narrowed his visible eye and turned to one of the treetops. You may as well come on out, Azula. I can sense you after all. The princess sl slowly got down from her position and glared at Naruto with her hands on her hips. I see Mai has learned quite a bit from you. I still don't see why you only focus on her when you can train others to use these gifts as well. Naruto kept his eye narrowed at her and retorted, Why would I waste my time on mindless fools who only live to lick the dirt off of your father's boots? At least Mai has the ability to show free will and expression, not mindless and blind loyalty to one's country. Azula grit her teeth at his words and her hands began to heat up with flames, making Naruto ready his guard slightly. And just what is so wrong with wanting to fight for one's country? I said blind loyalty, where one obeys and serves even though they know what they're doing is unjust and wrong. Surely you must see that the Fire Nation is destroying the world, Azula. Don't you realize that if your father continues this war of his, then the world will fall? And it won't be by the Fire Nation's hands, but something much more deadly and evil. What exactly will destroy us then, huh? Your little pet you keep locked up inside of you? She sneered making Kurama roar within Naruto. How dare that little brat call me a pet? I should take over and kill her now. It raged from within the mindscape. Calm down, Kurama. No need to waste your time on a naive child such as her, he admonished before glaring at Azula with a slitted blue eye. You should know by now that if I wanted to destroy this world, I would have done it years ago. No, the threat I speak of is one on a spiritual level, one that affects us all, and that even I will have trouble with. He yelled making her take an unconscious step back. If this war continues, darkness will spread and increase the chances of this threat becoming real. And when that happens, you, me, and this whole damn world will fall into the depths of destruction and despair. By this at this point, chakra and killer intent were slowly leaking off of the blonde making Azula have trouble breathing and standing. She was amazed at the power the blonde had, even though it was nowhere near its peak. But still, his words got her to think about the war itself. She saw the harm it caused for other nations, but she saw it as just in the eyes of the Fire Nation. What did this relic from the past know about her country and the war that they fight in every day? Naruto sensed her thoughts and stopped the flow of his energy while giving Azula a disappointed look, making her glare at him. Even though this is not my time, I'm going to prevent this world's destruction, Azula. And if that means going against you, your father, and the entire Fire Nation. He then stared at her with a QB enhanced eye, so be it. He then faded into a flock of crows before Azula that flew through the skies and out of her sight. The princess kept glaring at the crows until she lost sight of them before thinking, this could be bad for us and for father. I better warn him about this and about Mai's possible change of loyalty before it's too late. Nearly five months later, three days before the end of the year. Naruto stood before Ozai with Mai who had greatly exceeded his expectations. Over the time spent training, Mai had signed the Gama contract and had officially become a summoner of the clan. At first, she was like Naruto had started, tadpoles and baby toads. But after a month of trying, she had accomplished in summoning a man-sized battle toad to fight alongside her. Still, even with low Jonin level reserves, summoning took a lot out of her, and she was not ready to try and summon one of the clan that was the size of Shun. Her right ton training had also increased with her learning two more jutsu. The first one was called Jibashi, Electromagnetic Murder, a technique that released a wave of lightning to her opponents. The second one Mai had begun to learn, but was not quite there yet due to her hesitation in learning it. 
How could she not be hesitant seeing as it was a technique that nearly killed her teacher when he was younger than her? After all, the Chidori was not a jutsu to take lightly. Naruto knew of her hesitation and kept reminding her that Sasuke had misused the jutsu, which was created for the sake of defending comrades, not running them through. However, even with the reassurance, Mai was only able to create a small ball of lightning that would only pierce into a boulder and not through it. Her Nara techniques had increased in strength to low Jonin status, and she had even begun to create her own unique jutsu, Kage no Kusari, Shadow Chains. Like the name implies, Mai uses her shadow to create chains in a similar fashion as the Kage Nui is used. However, unlike the Kage Nui, the chains were able to wrap around her targets as well as stab into them. Lastly, her previous skills had all increased greatly. With her weights on, Mai was as fast as Rock Lee when he wore his own weights. Her speed without them was only slightly slower than his when his weights were off, but she was improving. Naruto had also placed seals on her left arm to hold her bow and quiver for quick access, while also placing seals on her wrists that held Sinbon and Shuriken in them. Each seal held 20, 20 Shuriken and 45 Sinbon for her to call upon. All in all, Mai was a high chunin bordering on low jonin in Naruto's eyes, a perfect place to be at for what he had planned. The previous night, Naruto had received a vision in his sleep concerning the awakening of the long-lost avatar. In the vision, he saw two shadowy figures approach a large dome of ice that held two other figures, on the size of a person, and the other the size of a large beast. The person-sized figure in the ice opened its glowing white eyes before the vision faded. Throughout the morning, Naruto had felt a growing source of power from the south that had him slightly distracted since he knew that the avatar must have been in that direction in their icy prison. When he informed Mai of this, she asked if he was going to leave which he gave affirmation to as well as telling her that her crossroad was upon her. This made my nervous and worried as they stood in front of Ozai in his throne room. So, you mean to tell me that you plan to leave in search of the Avatar, Uzumaki? Asked the Fire Lord after hearing of Naruto's plans for departure. Yes, that is my plan. The world is in jeopardy, and I need to make sure that the Avatar is ready enough for the trials ahead. Ozai then turned his gaze to Mai and questioned, and what of your student? Surely you don't plan to just leave her here? Internally, Ozai was hoping that the blonde would do just that so that he may influence Mai into teaching his soldiers how to use chakra and jutsu. Naruto narrowed his eye at the man and answered, that is her choice to make. Whether she stays here or goes with me is her decision. The two men then turned their gazes to Mai who was desperately trying to come up with an answer. Obey her country, or follow her heart. It was the biggest decision that she had ever come across, and it was slowly tearing her up inside. However, as she was thinking through this, she, she heard a voice say to her, If you stay here, then you will never have someone as close to you as Naruto has been. You know this. After all, it is what you are most afraid of, being alone in this world once again. You know what you want, so go for it you troublesome girl. Mai looked back to the men in front of her, eyes full of determination, and spoke. I choose to follow Naruto-sensei on his search for the avatar. Naruto smiled at his student while Ozai seated on his throne, causing the flames in front of him to rage. I guess I have no choice then. Guards, seize the girl. She is a beneficial and irreplaceable asset to our military. Mai tensed as the guards surrounded them while Naruto glared at Ozai in rage. Placing a hand on Mai's shoulder, he whispered, Do you trust me? Immediately, she answered, With my life. Then brace yourself, he ordered before she turned to see his eye change into the man GQ. The next thing she saw was a distortion in the space around her before she disappeared before the eyes of everyone in the room. While Ozai and his guard stood in shock, Naruto cracked his neck and pulled out a kunai before his blue eye became slitted. You won't stop me from leaving with my student, Ozai. He then flew through hand seals before he summoned Gamashun in the throne room, who obliterated the roof due to his enormous stature. Naruto stood atop the toad's head and ordered, Shun, we're leaving. Make your way towards the South Pole. Why there, Naruto-sama? Asked the Gama chief. 
because someone of great importance is there and I need to see them. The toad nodded before he tensed his legs for a large leap. Hold on, Naruto-sama. He called before he bounded into the sky, avoiding many blasts of fire from Ozai and his guards, and landed near the town. In another leap, he landed in the waters of the ports before he kept moving south as he was ordered. Along the way, Naruto released Mai from the Manjikyu realm and helped her steady herself on the toad's head. Are you all right? She slowly regained her bearings before she answered, Yeah, I'll be okay. What did you do to me? I basically removed you from the area and kept you safe in my eyes realm so that Ozai's men wouldn't take you. He then looked back to the city getting smaller and smaller upon the horizon. We're long gone from the capital now, Mai. Mai turned her own gaze to the distancing city before she sighed in slight exhaustion. When Naruto looked to her worriedly, she smiled to him and surprised him by embracing him in a hug. Thank you for everything, Naruto. For teaching me, befriending me and taking me with you, she said while embracing him. Naruto smiled warmly to the young woman and gazed to the southern horizon. You don't need to thank me, Mai. That's what teachers and friends do. Still though, I am glad that you took me up on my offer to train you. Mai let go of him before she sat next to him and stared at the horizon as well. So, what now, Naruto? Naruto chuckled and answered, now? Now, we begin your first ever S-rank mission, finding the Avatar and seeing if they have what it takes to protect the world. Chapter 6, Search for the Avatar the winds howled and stirred up the already raging blizzard as Naruto and Mai made their way towards the southern water tribe. Naruto was able to walk through the frigid air with little difficulty due to his knowledge in katan manipulation. Mai on the, the other hand. Achu. Sneezed the Nara descendant for the fifth time making Naruto mentally curse himself once again for not giving Mai the proper time to prepare for the trip. Mai was constantly rubbing her arms in order to keep them warm, while Naruto used his chakra to warm up his body. An idea came to him, and he took off his Sanin Hayori and draped it over Mai. She immediately drew it closer to her in order to stave off the cold while Naruto focused chakra into his pointer finger and made a seal on the back of the Hayori. As soon as the seal was made and activated, Mai felt warmth flood her body and drive away the coldness surrounding her. She turned to Naruto for an explanation and he elaborated, I made a temporary seal and placed it on the coat so that you could stay warm. The seal releases a constant emission of Katan Chakra to warm up your body, but it will only last about three hours. We better find the southern tribe soon. The duo continued their trek through the raging snowstorm before Naruto spotted a cave for them to take a rest in. Once they made it there, the Uzumaki wasted no time in unsealing a couple of blankets for them and handed them both to his student. She gratefully took them and leaned against the cavern wall while Naruto focused his gaze on the blizzard outside. Is the Avatar even at the South Pole, Sensei? I'm positive that they are. I sense their power originating from here, but we can't get any closer due to this storm. Not to mention that Shun got a pretty serious skin condition from the salt water of the ocean. Ocean. I can't believe I forgot that toads hate salt water. Mai gave a small smile at Naruto's blunder and slowly felt her eyelids droop before she tried to shake herself awake. Naruto watched his student fight against her need for sleep and saw that sleep ended up being the victor this time. Mai was out like a light, leaving Naruto to his thoughts. He leaned his head back against the cavern wall and closed his eyes in meditation. It wasn't much longer before a strange, yet also comforting, sight entered his mind. The vision he saw was of two faceless figures, both of them feminine in shape. The first figure was a woman with long black hair and red robes sitting on a small field watching the second figure. The second figure was smaller than the first, almost child-sized. The girl had dark red hair that reached her shoulders and black clothes while having an air of innocence and purity. She was seen running around the field in happiness before she turned her faceless gaze to him and waved. Seeing the girl waving made the woman turn her gaze to him as well. 
She stood up and pulled the girl, who Naruto now assumed was her daughter, close to her before he heard his name whispered through the air. Naruto! Called out Mai as she shook Naruto awake. He sat up quickly and looked at their surroundings with a shocked look on his face, concerning Mai. Are you alright? You were mumbling in your sleep and your face is covered in sweat. Naruto took slow breaths to calm himself while the last scene of the vision swam through his mind. Who are those two? And why do they seem so familiar to me? He wiped the sweat from his face before he turned to Mai. Yeah, I'll be fine. I just had a strange dream. Mai looked to him in concern before she hesitantly relented and packed away the blankets into a storage scroll. The winds have calmed down slightly. We should be able to move on, sensei, she said to him as she made her way out of the cave. Naruto's Naruto sighed before he followed her. Unknown to him, Kurama was reviewing the dream Naruto had and could only sigh at what it meant. If he ever uncovers the truth of this, no doubt he'll forget what he must do for the world. Naruto, I hope that when you eventually come to the realization of who those two were that you'll do what must be done when the time comes. The two shinobi trekked through the knee-deep snow as they tried to locate the southern tribe. They were getting closer since Naruto had sensed a small group of people around 10 miles from their location. Suddenly, Naruto tensed and turned his gaze skyward, just in time to see a white-furred creature in the distance followed by a ball of fire. He lifted the hair away from his Sharingan just in time to get a glimpse of a figure in orange and red clothing swing a staff at the flaming sphere and redirect it into the frozen cliffside. He got a better feel for the figure's energy signature and sighed before turning to Mai. It looks like we just missed them. The Avatar, along with two others, is riding out of here on a flying white creature. My side is well and muttered, troublesome. She then looked to the partly cloudy sky and asked, so what now? We can't ask Shun to help us since the salt water isn't good for him. What do we do? Naruto responded by turning away from her and crouching down with his arms in a position meant for carrying a person. Get on, he ordered. You're gonna carry us across the water after the Avatar? She deadpanned. Not across the water, over it. Get on and I'll show you. He heard her sigh again before she, before she climbed onto his back. He felt her get slightly embarrassed by it, but checked it off as not wanting to be carried by her teacher. Once he had her secured, he pumped Chakra into his legs and rocketed into the air resulting in my clinging to him out of surprise. Once they began to descend back to the ground, Naruto used Futon Chakra to create a solid surface of wind underneath his feet before he kicked off of it. This was the peak of Naruto's Futon manipulation, a jutsu he called Kazipo, wind step, that allowed him to travel through the air as if he were moving through treetops. Mai was in awe at the view from the air. She saw clouds pass by as well as small islands far down beneath them. It amazed her that her sensei was able to actually move through the air, as if he were standing on solid ground. This is amazing. Naruto chuckled at her comment. Yeah, it took me quite a while to figure out this jutsu. Even with all of the clones I used to help me, it took over five years to complete. Why didn't you use this when we left the Fire Nation? Even though this jutsu is complete, it takes a lot of chakra and concentration to use. Using it while under fire wouldn't have been wise, so I had Shun take us instead. Unfortunately, I forgot about the toad's dislike for salt water. In the distance, Naruto spotted the flying creature carrying the avatar. We're catching up to them. Are we going to talk to them right away, or are we going to wait and observe them first? It would be best to see what they're made of before I tell them of future threats. For now, we'll keep a safe distance before we talk to them. With Aang. On the head of Appa, his flying bison, sat the last airbender and the avatar, Aang. While being actually 112 years old, the airbender was still physically 12, and incredibly naive to the time he was in now compared to 100 years ago. With him were two members of the Southern Water Tribe, Katara, a novice waterbender who went with Aang in hopes of mastering waterbending, and Sokka, Katara's older brother who was a warrior of the tribe. 
He went with Aang to keep close to his younger sister and protect, and protect her, something their father ordered him to do before he left to join the war effort. The trio was flying towards the Southern Air Temple in hopes of finding any air nomads or anything left behind by them. Katara and Sokka were skeptical of any survivors of the airbender genocide, but they did not want to shatter the young avatar's hope. It was about ten minutes later before they arrived at the temple, only to see it devoid of life and slowly falling apart. Aang, clinging on to that small shred of hope, decided to check the air temple sanctuary where his old teacher monk Gyatso told him that someone would need him and teach him how to be a better avatar. After opening the doors, the trio found the inside to be not what they were expecting. Statues, that's it? Where's the meat? Complained Sokka. Katara rolled her eyes at her brother's antics before she turned her attention to the statues filling up the room. These people must have been very important to have statues made after them. Yeah. Hey, that one's a waterbender. Pointed out Aang. And that one's an airbender. Katara then looked closer at the statues before stating, they're put into a cycle. Look, air, water, earth, and fire. That's the avatar cycle. Of course. These are all avatars. All of these people are your past lives, Aang. Wow. There's so many. He commented in awe of it all. Katara, you don't really believe in that past lives fable, do you? Asked Sokka. It's true. When the avatar dies, they're reincarnated into the next nation in the cycle. She then turned her attention back to Aang, only to see him in a trance in front of a Fire Nation avatar. Who is that? Broken from the trance, Aang answered, that's Avatar Roku, the avatar before me. You were a firebender? No wonder I didn't trust you before, commented Sokka. There's no nameplate on the statue. How do you know his name? Asked Katara. I'm not sure, it just feels like I know him somehow. Sokka groaned at the, the airbender's answer. You know, you just couldn't get any weirder. Suddenly, they heard some footsteps and turned to see a small lemur in the doorway. Aang was excited to see another remnant of his people, while Sokka was happy to find food. This initiated a race between the two of them to get to the lemur first. Fire Nation Controlled Port Prince Zuko and his uncle Iroh were making their way to an arena where Zuko was to have an Agni Kai with Commander Zhao, a high-ranking firebender who had riled up the prince. Once they reached the arena, Zuko and Zhao had their backs to one another in kneeled positions. Remember your firebending basics, Prince Zuko. They are your greatest weapons, advised Iroh. I refuse to let him win. Zuko stated as he turned to face Zhao. Zhao rose as well and turned to Zuko. This will be over quickly. Immediately after the gong initiating the match rang, Zhao proved to be more than a match for Zuko, effortlessly avoiding and nullifying all of the prince's fire blasts. As Zuko caught his breath, Iroh continued to advise Zuko to remember his basics while Zhao proceeded to throw his own volley of fire blasts. Zuko was able to block each, but was slowly forced back with every parry. For the final blast, Zhao used both fists, forming a blast that connected and knocked Zuko to the ground. Pressing the attack, Zhao leapt into the air, covered the distance between him and Zuko, and prepared a finishing fire blast aimed directly for the prince's face. An instant before contact, Zuko rolled out of the way, rose with a kicking flourish, and knocked Zhao out of his stance. With newfound vigor, Zuko released a series of low attacks that caused Zhao to retreat, and finished him with a jet of fire from a full body kick. As the prince stood ready to strike Zhao a final time, Zhao yelled out, Do it! Do it! To Zhao's surprise, the strike meant to mark Zuko's victory was aimed past his face instead. Looking to the scorched ground, Zhao questioned, That's it? Your father raised a coward. Next time you get in my way, I promise, I won't hold back, Zuko declared as he walked away from his defeated opponent. Zhao, full of anger and embarrassment, made to strike Zuko's unguarded back, but was stopped by Iroh. As Zuko made to engage Zhao again, 
Iroh held him back and stated, No Prince Zuko. Do not taint your victory. He then turned back to Zhao while commenting, So this is how the great commander Zhao acts in defeat? Disgraceful. Even in exile, my nephew is far more honorable than you are. The duo then made their way back to their ship with Zuko feeling grateful to his uncle for his words. Air Temple After chasing the lemur for a while, Aang came across the skeletal remains of Gyatso. Seeing his teacher and father figure's remains caused him to weep before rage took over at the sight of aged Fire Nation uniforms. In his rage, Aang called upon the power of his past lives, making his airbender tattoos glow along with his eyes. A dome of wind surrounded him, pushing back everything and whipping up the air into a hurricane. Naruto, who was hidden out of sight with Mai, felt the power Aang was calling upon reach near Kage level in strength. Damn it. At this rate, the kid will destroy the mountain in his rage. I have to do something. The last Uzumaki was about to step in before he heard Katara say to Aang, I know you're upset, and I know what it's like to lose the people you love. I went through the same thing when I lost my mom. Monk Gyatso and the other air nomads may be gone, but you still have a family. Family. Sokka and I, we're your family now. Her words reached Aang as the wind slowly died down, but his features were still glowing. The Water Tribe siblings walked up to him and placed reassuring hands on the boy's shoulders. Katara and I aren't going to let anything happen to you, we promise, declared Sokka as Aang finally released the energy and collapsed into Katara's arms. I'm sorry. It's okay. You weren't yourself, reassured the waterbender. But you were right. And if the Fire Nation found this temple, they must have found the other ones too. I really am the last airbender. He said sadly as Katara comforted him. Naruto sighed at how Aang was dealing with the loss of his people before he turned to leave with Mai in tow. Do you think he's ready, Sensei? No, he isn't. He lets his emotions take control of him so easily, making him lose focus and have to rely on the power of his past lives. He needs to be able to call upon and use his own power or else he will never be ready. After reuniting with the lemur, who Aang had decided to name Momo, the gang left the air temple and began making their way north once again while Naruto and Mai followed close behind. Three days later, Kyoshi Island. Naruto had to resist the urge to go and rip Aang a new one at the sight of the boy wasting his time riding giant koi fish. The boy had no sense of urgency or a real want to fulfill his duty to the world. Instead, he was only interested in showing off for his friends and behaving like a child. The Uzumaki had to constantly remind himself that Aang technically was still a child, but even he knew when the time was right to have fun and perform your duties. Mai merely laid down against the tree her sensei was residing in and gazed at the clouds. Clouds. It was a beautiful day and the masses of air and water were lazily drifting through the sky above them. The two perked up when a giant eel rose up from the water and tried to devour Aang. The boy would have been fish food, but he was able to get out of danger by using air bending to run across the water and back to shore. From his position in the tree, Naruto saw a group of around eight women dressed in armored robes waiting in the trees while watching the Avatar. The gang was blissfully unaware of their observers until the women dropped down from the trees and swiftly bound and blindfolded them. After taking them to the entrance of their village and tying them to the post of a statue of Avatar Kyoshi, they removed the blindfolds. Who are you and where are the men who ambushed us? Asked Sokka. There were no men, we ambushed you, answered the lead member of the women. Yeah right. Seriously, there's no way a bunch of girls took us down. A bunch of girls, ha. Huh? The Anegi is going to eat well tonight, she retorted while grasping the collar of his shirt. Wait. Please, he didn't mean it. My brother is just an idiot sometimes, pleaded Katara. The leader of the village stepped forward and questioned, Why are you here? If I didn't know any better, I'd say that you three were Fire Nation spies. We're not spies. We were just making a stop while on our way to the North Pole, answered Aang. A likely story. Know this, 
Kyoshi Island has peacefully stayed out of this war, and we intend to keep it that way. This island was named after Avatar Kyoshi? I know her. Ha! Huh. How could you know her when she's been dead for centuries? I know her because I'm the Avatar. That's impossible. It's impossible, stated the head warrior, the last Avatar was an airbender who disappeared from the world 100 years ago. That's me. Aang said with a small smile. The village leader had heard enough and ordered the trio to be sent to the Anagi. However, Aang proved his claim as the Avatar by airbending out of his bindings and floating to the ground. Left in awe at the sight of the Avatar, the villagers graciously welcomed Aang and his friends into their village and began to provide him with a charitable feast. With Zuko As the news of the Avatar's arrival to Kyoshi Island spread throughout the island, it was passed on to local fishermen who passed it on to a customer who passed it on to Prince Zuko as they served him a fried fish. The Avatars on Kyoshi Island? Uncle, ready the rhinos. He's not getting away from me this time. Are you going to finish that? Asked the retired general while pointing to the fish. Zuko took the plate away and yelled, I was saving it for later. Kyoshi Village As Aang showed off for the villagers and basked in the limelight, Saka swallowed his pride and asked to be taught by the Kyoshi warriors led by Suki. Katara on the other hand was packing supplies for the trip. Next to her, as she bought vegetables and meats, was Naruto who was also purchasing some food for his journey with Mai. He and Mai had entered the village easily, and Mai was in another part of the village, while he decided to get some supplies and observe the Avatar's friends. Katara was about to reach for a zucchini, but was stopped by Naruto who advised, You don't want that one, it isn't ripe yet. The waterbender got a better look at the Uzumaki and was confused at the style of clothing, the hair color, and why he was helping out a total stranger like her. Thanks, she said hesitantly as she reached for a different one. It amazes me that the so-called master of all elements is nothing more than a child who prefers to show off instead of fulfilling his duty. Duty. Katara sighed in disappointment at the truth of his words. Yeah, I would have thought he would be more focused on getting ready to move on. He is a child, Naruto reminded her. But still, he should be putting his duty to the world before anything else. Katara turned to him with a raised brow. Why are you so concerned about what Aang should be doing? The rest of the village seems fine just meeting him. True. However, I do not live here. I'm merely passing through with my student as we travel north. I heard the rumors of the Avatar's return and began wondering why we have just found out about it now. Why hasn't he performed the duties he is responsible for instead of parading around this village with young women chasing him out of adoration? I wish I knew. Katara sadly agreed. I mean, I know he doesn't know any other element but air, but he really should be more focused on learning the other elements and helping the world. The kid doesn't even know the other elements? Naruto thought in shock. That's unsettling, he commented. An avatar who only knows one element in a time where the world needs them most. He shook his head in disappointment before he paid for his supplies and walked away. This world is doomed, Katara heard him say. Katara sighed sadly before she paid for her own supplies and put them in the gang's apartment room. After that, she made her way to where Aang said he was going to ride the Anegi for the girls' entertainment. She walked past many of them before she spotted him out alone in the water. Katara, you showed up? He exclaimed happily. I wanted to make sure you were all right. You had me worried. She called out to him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I was acting like a spoiled jerk. Well get out of the water before you catch a cold, you big jerk. She ordered playfully making him smile. As he made his way to the shore, he was once again caught by surprise when the Anegi appeared and tried to eat him. He was able to grab a hold of one of its whiskers before it tossed him into the air. He landed painfully in the water and was rendered unconscious and floating out at sea. Katara quickly made her way to him and bent the water around them to quickly reach the shore once again. 
Once she made sure Aang was all right, she looked up from her position behind some rocks on the shore and saw Zuko and his men heading for the island village. It wasn't long before they began to set fire to it in hopes of Aang coming out to face him. As the rooftops burned, the Kyoshi warriors and Sokka, who was dressed in a Kyoshi warrior uniform, began to engage them in hope of driving them back. However, Zuko and his men proved to be too much for them, and they were easily knocked aside. Suddenly, the wind picked up around the village and a cry of futon, kaze no hasen, wind's divergence, was heard. The wind began to extinguish the flames and Zuko gaped in surprise at the sight of Naruto and my walking out from one of the buildings. Zuko. Good to see you again after over two years, Naruto greeted. What are you two doing here? Asked the prince. We are searching for the avatar, just like you are. Only, we are not searching to capture him. What do you mean? I need to capture him and take him back to my father. Naruto sighed in disappointment at Zuko's objective. Your father isn't interested in restoring your honor, Zuko. How can a man restore another man's honor? It isn't possible. Zuko glared at the Uzumaki and got in a ready stance while my reluctantly got in one in front of her teacher. If you won't let me get the avatar, then you are a traitor to the Fire Nation. How could I betray a nation I was not a part of? Besides, do you really think that burning a village just to find the avatar is the right thing to do, Zuko? Hey, over, over here. Called out Aang as he stood a fair distance away from them in determination. Zuko gave a small smirk and answered, does that answer your question? No, it doesn't. You never told me if you believed that it was right, and I wasn't asking if it was convenient or a decent tactic. Zuko chose to ignore him and fired a volley of fire at the airbender who batted them aside with his staff. Aang then spun his staff in a helicopter fashion, allowing him to glide over to his opponent. Zuko batted away Aang's staff and pushed him back before the airbender picked up two dropped battle fans and used them to blast a great amount of air pressure at Zuko. The strike landed and knocked the prince through a wall and into a building. The avatar turned to where he saw Naruto and Mai and was surprised to see that they had disappeared. Shaking it off, he retrieved his staff and met up with his friends on Appa to leave the village, hoping Zuko would follow and spare it from any further damage. As they were flying away from it, Aang saw that the buildings had caught fire again as the firebenders made their way back to the ship. He shocked his friends by jumping off of Appa and into the water below before he resurfaced on top of the Anegi and manipulated it into spitting water onto the flames. Once he saw that the village was no longer aflame, he allowed the giant eel to fling him into the air where he was caught by Appa and put back onto the passenger saddle. I know, I know that was stupid and dangerous, Aang stated before Katara could scold him. Yes, it was. She agreed. Incredibly so. Came Naruto's voice, making the gang turn to see him laying down on one of Appa's horns while my sat on the bison's head. Who are you? Asked Aang. You helped put out the flames before my fight with Z Zuko. And I talked to you in the marketplace, Katara added. Naruto turned his gaze to Aang and answered, I am the predecessor of you and all of the avatars before you. Aang looked surprised at that while Katara asked, What do you mean? Before the time of bending and the Avatar, I was known as the world's peacekeeper before I felt as if the duty and responsibility was too much and that someone like me was not needed in my time. I was known as the child of prophecy during my time and after I sealed myself away, I was known as the hero of the flame. The Avatar was made by the spirits to act as my replacement in maintaining peace in the world. How do we know that you aren't lying? For all we know, you could just be another person after Aang, stated Sokka. Naruto turned his gaze to Aang again and ordered, look me in the eye, Avatar. The truth will reveal itself to you. Aang was unsure at the order and kept his gaze averted before he unconsciously entered the Avatar state and met Naruto's blue eyes with his glowing ones. Visions filled the airbender's mind of a golden-haired man fighting against many opponents, beasts of incredible size and power, and speaking to a giant canine-like creature that was resting within a cage. 
The voices of his past lives rang in his mind, stating that the man before him was as ancient as bending itself before he released the power and left his avatar state. You really are my predecessor. Of course, I am, and I have something very important to tell you concerning the world. Why? What's going on? Naruto closed his eyes and slowly stated, the world will be destroyed soon by something on a spiritual level. You need to prepare, Avatar, or else the world will fall into darkness and chaos. Why? What is the threat? Asked Katara while Aang was digesting the info and Sokka was surprisingly quiet through it all. Mai was also paying attention since Naruto had not told her of this oncoming threat to the world. Naruto sighed before he moved to sit next to his student and gazed at the trio before him. Let me tell you about the great beast known as the Jubi. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfictions. Looking forward to having you on board again.